Welcome to Everything Life Coaching. I'm John Kim. And I'm Noelle Cordo. We are the founders of Lumia. And we're super passionate about all things coaching. And we want to share what we've learned from over a decade of coaching and training thousands of life coaches. Let's dive into the science and magic of coaching. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Everything Life Coaching. Noelle here with my friend, colleague, Lumia instructor, sexuality coach extraordinaire, Maria. How are you today? Hello and greetings. Oh, my goodness. I'm very excited to be here. I'm doing very, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Glad to hear it. So where in the world are you today? I am in Los Angeles, California. Yeah, amidst the heat wave, small oh. little here. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, Roger that. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're staying cool, and thank you so much for joining me to talk about our topic today, which is a day in the life of a professional sexuality coach. Mm-hmm. Now. You and I actually share a background in human sexuality, which is super rare. And so I'm so excited that we can have such a a, a deep conversation today. Um, But before we dive in, I just kind of want to orient folks to why we're having this conversation today. Um, I'm sure you've seen in your own practice an uptick in interest coming out of the pandemic for folks to really do this work as individuals and couples. And I've seen it both in my own practice and also reflected in the literature that in the space of wellness coaching, in the space of entrepreneurial coaching, when folks are really niching down uh, sexuality, working on relationships, working on dreams and hopes and desires is something that we know people want more of. What has been your experience? Yeah, the pandemic really brought to light a lot of um, relationship things because Mm we were cooped up. A lot of us were cooped up with partners. We learned a lot of things about each other. Uh, A lot of us spent a lot of time on social media learning about relationships and, and, and seeing, I feel like there's been an uptick in things like ethical non-monogamy and things like kink, things um, straying away from the quote unquote norm, um, the vanilla norm that we see in society. And I think it's this curiosity that's been bubbling in a lot of people. And, uh, that's always been in a lot of people that just kind of came out during the pandemic in these last few years, as we're starting to notice, wow, there's, I can define what I want in a relationship. And there are lots of other people who want to do that too. And lots of people who don't want to be stuck in the, in, in the traditional sort of monogamous westernized vanilla relationships. And they're learning a lot more about the spectrum of relationships. And I think it's beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, I think we have Dan Savage to credit with monogamish and really getting that vernacular out there. Um, When I was studying in my PhD, almost 10 years ago, God, um, my focus was on non-monogamy and kink. And that's a big part of of what I, non-monogamy specifically is the practice. Um, And 10 years ago, it was really taboo. And the fear around having conversations about opening up or kink or alternative lifestyles was uh, heavy. And I feel like that has changed to your point because of of public discourse and um, visible, lots of visible options out there in news, media, um, fiction, shows, movies, you know, whatever. When, When people come to you, when people come to your practice, who's showing up and and what are they showing up with? My niche of clients has been a lot of men. Mm-hmm. heterosexual men and a lot of folks coming to terms with their kinks and mm-hmm. who don't go about it and it was fascinating because I never really thought I'd work with men um I'm a queer woman um I date women <laughs> and I I it was not really a population that I wanted to work with as I when I was a baby coach because of my own own personal struggles and traumas that have been with men um and then i started opening myself up to it and therapy's great too 
I started realizing, oh, a lot of men are coming to me. And I wonder if it's just because I am, I'm a queer woman <laughs> and I won't judge them for what they're going through. They feel maybe a little safer with me. Maybe they find some commonality with, with me. Yeah. A lot of men in my coaching practice and also a lot of folks who are coming to terms with their kinks and, and don't know how to go about it. So I find that very exciting and I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love working with men, working with kink newbies. What does that process of awareness look like for somebody to come to terms with a kink? So, you know, for our listeners at home, both coaches, clients, people who are thinking about coaching, people who are thinking about sexuality coaching, what's that like on the client side of the journey? I feel like it's, it's a lot of societal, societal things and cultural things that we grew up with. That have told us, you know, no, you can't do this. That's not allowed. That's bad. That's in the DSM. Blah blah blah. You can't do. That. That's not what a good person would do. And I feel like that's what a lot of folks are coming to me with. That's the a lot of the baggage that most of us carry. I carried a lot of that shit when I was coming up, and that's why I'm a sexuality educator and a coach today. And I think it's just, uh, just, just telling them it's okay. I feel like that is a huge, huge step in in their breakthrough. Hey, yeah. it's okay. And they're like, oh, I had no idea. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. That's a more common kink than than you would have thought. Like, you're not you're not abnormal for this. That is actually a normal thing because I feel like most people that. You come across, think of these things, then not, you know? <laughs> and I think it's just letting them know it's okay. Um, and then you just see a really huge breakthrough. I feel like it's that allowance for a lot of folks. Absolutely. And this is so beautifully aligned with the top of topic of coaching itself, because coaching in a nutshell is coming home to yourself. And really from a strengths-based values and and self awareness, self integration, self actualization perspective, saying you know what would my life look like if I began living from the inside out versus living from the outside in, which is I think that 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 juxtaposition is helping people begin to conceptualize well what does that even look like to live from the inside out, um, and then what ways have I been limiting myself by trying to live from, you know, the outside, outside in. I love that the outside yeah. in you're supposed to be this, you're supposed to be married and have 2.2 kids. You're supposed to have this white picket fence. You're supposed to be monogamous. You're supposed to not be attracted to anybody else out there when, when really we should be kind of re re rearranging our thoughts to, I, I want this. I desire this. I need this in a relationship and find people who align with that. And like you said, from, from the inside out, you know, I desire this. I would like this. And just letting people know it is okay to want that. It is okay to desire that. Um, because I feel like the traditional views of relationships have been very constricting for a lot of folks. Esther Perel talks a lot about relationships and how. The traditional and, and standard view of relationships, we have to be everything for the other is a little bit hard to, to grasp in the re reality of things is that we have to be living with this duality of, yes, I can love this someone, but I can also feel attracted to this person, you know, things like that. And I think, you know, if we're looking at population demographics, it's, it's really changing to support this concept of diversity, because even thinking about you know, how people change and flow over a lifespan, a person that you may have met and partnered with in your 20s is going to be a different species of human from the person you have stayed with and are partnered with in your 40s. And so there's there's lots of different accounting for life stage changes, chapters, kids, no kids, career, no career, on we go in the merry-go-round of life, right? Um I think a question that a lot of folks coming into coach training or ICF specific coach training programs like ours is, well, you know, how do we get into 
a niche like this? And, and could I, as a coach, support someone, a client, even if they're not coming to me for sexuality, or could I support a client with these tenets? And something that I think about uh, as foundational to doing any kind on any topic is communication, active listening, speaking up, speaking out. And then when someone has decided to take an action step, facilitating learning and growth by taking a 360 degree walk around, well, what are the barriers? What are the risks? You know, what are the threats? And so I believe, and I'd love your perspective, that if, if a coach was simply armed with really strong technique around active listening, asking questions, making positive strengths-based statements, and doing a 360 action step plan around moving forward, that sexuality is a really coachable topic. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like when when folks come to me and ask me, like, how do I do this as a coach? How do I do this as a person? You know, approach sexuality in a more sex positive way and um, talk about it with others. I feel like the biggest thing when someone brings something up, like an issue regarding sexuality, I think the biggest thing that comes up, the biggest feeling that comes up in a lot of people is the ick or the slightly judgmental feeling like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, doing that, like you're married. Why are you talking about how you like someone? It's the, it's the ick and the slight discomfort that comes up in folks. And that discomfort is coming from, you know, society bombarding us with, you should do this. You should be this. You should love like this. You shouldn't love like this. That's bad. Blah, blah, blah. And I feel like the best way to start taking that 360 view is to hold on to that discomfort just a little bit instead of, oh my gosh, you shouldn't be attracted to that person. You know, I feel like that's the first inkling that comes up and it should be, I feel like the best way is just kind of sit with that discomfort a little bit and then start asking questions, you know, like, okay, what is this was? what does that look like to you? Like start getting curious about their perspective and then you could slowly release a lot of the tension that, that you're holding. Right. And, and start to pivot, start to take those little tiny steps and maybe you'll learn something new from their perspective that you've never heard before. And maybe it can help you kind of understand that perspective too. Um, I feel like because society has bombarded us with so many messages about sex and sexuality and gender and relationships, it is almost instinctive and almost a, it's like a reflex, that ick factor, the, oh my gosh, you shouldn't be doing that factor. When I think when we, when we, when we feel that we can start to slow down and be like, okay, let me just ask more questions. This is such a great point about coaching mindset, right? So in, in coaching mindset, as coach practitioners, we know that we come as a package deal for ourselves with our own set of biases, our own community, nation, family of origin, um, our own internalized rules about how things should be, what's right, what's wrong. And moreover, the point where I think that that ick factor comes in is when something is perceived as a threat. When something is perceived um, as, as a threat to the individual, to the society, to the community. And that's the point at which, as a coach, as you've shared, like saying, yeah, ooh, I hit, I hit a bias point here. And I know that I need to, to become a conduit for somebody else's life. Put that aside for exploration with a coaching supervisor or therapist and really turn to the client to understand uh, their needs. And Mm -hmm. if, and as a coach practitioner, if you feel that you've really hit a point where you can't give someone a fair shake in that space, um, the ICF standards call for the coach practitioner to halt the coaching relationship and to refer that client out to someone you know who can who can truly serve them better. Um, I've had experiences, not in coaching scenarios, but in therapeutic scenarios, where the the therapist has not um, been versed in sexuality or has not been um, sex positive, and who has shared alarm with me about myself and having had that experience as a client 
<laughs> it's confusing. <laughs> it's not fun. It creates dysphoria. Um, and, and that's something that, that we want to, you know, be, be aware of as, as coaches. And it's always okay to say, oh, wow, like, you know, what you just shared surprised me. Give me a second. Right. Right. You, you got me all riled up when you were talking about that. <laughs> yeah. There, I, my goal ultimately is to be a um, you know sexuality educator and a sex therapist still. So working through that, uh, that, that shit takes years. <laughs> yeah. But what I found in the field of therapy and sex therapy is not all therapists are trained to talk about sex and relationships when, you know, I think most of us think that, hey, they're a safe space, but yeah, a lot of them don't know how to speak about it because we're not taught that in school and it's it's not their fault. You know, like the lack of sex education, the lack of sex positive resources that we have in the society, that's like a whole nother rant that I can spend 16 hours on. Um, but in the therapy world, um, there is that lack of education around it. Even in the sex therapy realm, I feel like there's only, it's so new. There's still a few modalities out there. There's still, there's not a lot of the most evidence-based theories because it's so new and we need time to learn about this stuff, let alone kink um, affirming stuff, uh, kink affirming therapy. You know, that's like a whole tiny niche in and of itself. And I feel like uh, that the, the coaching realm kind of parallels that too. Um, and there's still a lot of work that we need to do in terms of bringing forth this education to the masses. I mean, that's, that's one of my big goals too, as a coach and as a future therapist is to bring kink affirming, to bring a sex positive, um, a viewpoint out there and also a kink affirming viewpoint out there, because we need to talk about these things and more often than not I hear stories about folks being kink shamed in therapy or, mm icked in therapy because of some sexuality related issue that they brought up and that brings more shame we don't need more shame around sex and sexuality a point that it's important for coach practitioners to understand is that you don't have to be able to speak about sexuality in order to do a good job as a coach you simply need to be aware of what it feels like when a bias pops up and be able to put it aside in order to center the human in front of you. Um, you can, a, a great response if somebody brings up something that surprises you and you get that feeling, it's like, oh, tell me more. Or cool, tell me more. And, and to just pump that back to the client because you actually don't need any direct expertise to understand the needs, wants, and desires of somebody else. You just need to really be able to hold it down in a safe container, of course, with the ethics at play, which is intent to harm self or others, or something that is, you know, very illegal, in which case we need to have a conversation with the client and refer out and move on with all of the steps implicit, you know, in that. So um, this is, this is a rich area for coaches. Um, when you, when you work with clients, what is what is the typical session set like? Do you do group? Do you do couples? Do you do individual? How long do you typically work with someone? Yeah, so I do individuals and couples as well. The couple sessions are a little longer, um, around 80 minutes, and then the individuals are about 50 minutes. Um, and a typical session would would look like kind of all the things that we go through in, in Lumia training. Um uh, what are you here for? Where would you like to be? What's getting in the way and, and, and breaking through that and then having these conversations about that. And um, I feel like with, with sexuality issues, there's a lot of big breakthroughs because in the coaching space in the sexuality coaching space, it's, it's the one space that most people can um, get to and, and spill the beans in the way. Because it's hard to have a safe container out there, right? With with friends, with family, no, definitely not <laughs> for most of us. Like friends can, you know, sometimes have their biases. Um, society and culture have a lot of their biases. And in the coaching realm, the coaching container, I feel like it is the one safe space for a lot of clients that I see to kind of spill the beans and 
it's kind of beautiful to just see all the beans being spilled. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about it. Just yeah. throw them all. We'll, 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 we'll organize them and put them together as we go. Right. So I yes. feel like a bit of it um, looks like. Like working through shame is a big thing. Um, working through, you know, it's okay for you to think that. It's okay for you to do that. Um, working through shame and then letting them know it's okay. Yeah. So if you're if you're designing action steps for a client to move towards their desired outcome, you know, so it's a step one, and and I think with with the spilling the beans part, with kind of clearing, venting, getting to the root of the issue, really exploring it, phase one, um, coach practitioners who are newbies to this space or who may encounter it through another coaching engagement that, hey, this is just what's coming up for your client. Um, something important to be aware of is that um, I think in that space, oftentimes clients are testing. They're testing their own voice. And so they may share things in a way that you may sit there as a coach practitioner and say, is this person trying to shock me? And not necessarily, they're just trying to test the limits of their own voice and the limits of their own thought and the limits of the reaction that they might get from someone else. And so holding it down <laughs> as a coach with your poker face, you know, is, is key in this. It's like, yep, tell me anything. <laughs> like, Especially, and I know I have had, I have had my boundaries tested and yes, in the sexuality field, you will get some unusual folks who yes. will who think differently about what you do and try to push the boundaries. And yeah, you just have to sit there with your poker face and be like, I don't think this is the right fit. I think you might hear some resources where I that might, that I think might be work better for you, you know, <laughs> uh, but definitely keeping that poker face <laughs> for sure. And yeah. uh, not letting that voice that's screaming in your head take over. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, right. Right. Exactly. You know, exactly. Or just like a lot of times I'm like, well, that's really interesting. Okay. Back to session, you know, <laughs> like it's uh, yeah. So th as you're moving past that phase and you're into designing actions with your client and actually having them move into like real life, what is that experience like for the client? And what's that like for you as the practitioner? Uh, a, a common example that I see in my practice is when folks come to me and want to learn more about their kinks, you know, some time for them to lay it all out and spill the beans, right? Spill all the beans, right? There's some taking some time to do that. Um, and then, um, and then, uh, you know, talking through a lot of times there's shame attached to that. And, and, um, you know, having conversations about like, where could this be coming from and stuff like that. And then, providing some resources and psychoeducation about what's going on in your head, right? Mm. And what's going on uh, with the psychology of this kink that maybe you might be having, right? Um, letting them know it's okay. Like, this is a natural thing. <laughs> this is a normal thing to be curious about this um, because you're human. We're curious creatures. We want to address societal norms a lot of the time. Kink is the space to do that. And so giving them space to spill the beans, providing some resources and psychoeducation about this stuff, and then um, helping them through, uh, helping them through uh, taking practical steps, uh, applying it to real life. Yeah. Hey, you want to continue with this? Maybe tr let's, let's explore what it's like meeting other people in this community, mm -hmm. right? Taking some in-person classes, perhaps seeing uh going to local munches and munches are uh the events where um kinky folks hang out in a, a, a vanilla space where you know no one's dressed up in leather or anything they're just dressed up in our normal garb and we they meet at like a restaurant or a bar and they just talk about things right uh, there's no pressure to um do anything kinky in that setting you're just talking and making friends so the spilling the beans and then the resources and psychoeducation and then helping them walk through taking uh practical steps 
real life steps to start exploring more if they choose. Yeah. I, I work similarly with, with a slight differentiation. I ask my clients to find their own resources. And I ask, and that's part of the discovery phase of like really taking ownership and accountability of like, I want you to push out into the world and come back to me with validated research about what you've learned. I want you to go find the munches and the groups and the online communities and report back to me with what you've learned. And the reason I bring that up is because I want to demonstrate that as a coach, I do have expertise, but I don't need it because I can redirect the client towards their own version of self-exploration and then come back to the table to, to really kind of vet it out. Thinking about the early days of your practice, if you could go back and give yourself hard-won lessons, things that you wished you knew when you first started out, what would some of those things be? Social media sucks. Very sex negative space. And I, I feel like I've been through three, four, five different Instagrams because of how sex negative they were. Yeah. Um, it's I don't know if you've noticed, but on on social media, we have to we have to censor things. We can't say the word sex. We can't spell it out. You'll see some educators spell it S E G G S, so uh, it doesn't get picked up by the censors, right? Because wow. It, it, it's very easy for the sensors and the algorithm to pick it up and then just block your page. Mm. It's happened a few times and it's very frustrating, you know, um, and uh, salty world, uh, has done some, um, um, uh, research on this and how biased the algorithm is actually towards people of color, um, non cis presenting humans, <laughs> queer folks out there when it comes to talking about sex and sexuality. Um, yeah, yeah. I, that's another 16-hour rant that I could say, but I would encourage folks to look up the Salty World um, research that they have on it. Uh, I wish I could have learned a little bit more about that so I didn't exert a lot of my energy going into it mm. and then just, just get blasted, you know, yeah. <laughs> going th- about it and with uh with more caution i would say um because yeah unfortunately social media is a very sex negative space still and social media is the one place where we can advertise for free a sexuality educator so i wish i would have known that a little bit any megatron has awesome resources um um uh, on that and talking about like the algorithm and talking about how that affects sexuality educators, people of color, um, queer folks, things like that. Fascinating stuff. So I wish I would have known that. I think over the years I've gotten much better at this, but y- the discomfort feelings that come up, <laughs> the discomfort muscles that <laughs> learning to tame those, that takes time, I feel like. And with sex, sexuality like what you're saying a lot of times people test your limits get the weirdos out there yeah and the weird messages and the weird conversations <laughs> i'm just like cool i don't want to be sex negative I, I, but also this is like where the boundary is crossed and i must put a stop to this i wish i could have um practiced that a little more or anticipated that a little more uh so yeah yeah sex space <laughs> get the whole the whole spectrum of individuals indeed i know that a best practice is to have um in your arsenal a series of people that you can refer out to or a series Mm -hmm. of organizations or resources that you can refer out to so for folks who are listening are like well how do i set those boundaries um what advice would you offer um yeah, as my practice has gone up, that that list of resources has grown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I realize how important it is to have that as a backup. You know, Ooh, connecting with other educators in the field. <laughs> um, yeah, connecting with them, um, engaging with them, and um, um, building resources up that way. And then a lot of it was m- m- me looking things up too. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, I feel like getting to know as many other people in the field as possible is a great resource. 
because sometimes it does feel like a very lonely field um, when you're by yourself. Most educators are doing things online. I've Maybe. found the the space of sexuality educators and coaches who do this work to be really friendly, that people are typically delighted to learn that there's somebody else out there that thinks their resources are cool, that might want to refer, have a conversation, you know, partner, because it is such a specialized, lonely space. So I would say to folks, you know, don't be afraid to fangirl. Don't be afraid to reach out and tell somebody, hey, I really admire your, your work. Can I refer to you? Um, and most people are really, you know, super duper welcoming. Right, right. Even the toughest looking doms out there, like, we're also inside. <laughs> we all still have feelings. We all like it when people come to us with nice words. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so for folks who are interested in reaching you with nice words or potentially even as clients, where can folks find you? Yeah, folks can find me on my Instagram. So at underscore, don't forget the underscore, sex and squats. And then my website is sexandsquats.org. And then folks can reach me via email, um, mariatwostraps at gmail.com. Well, I have so thoroughly enjoyed the time that we have gotten to spend together today. Thank you so much. And I know so many people will just be excited to learn about this potential outlet for coaching uh, in all of the different ways. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll do it again. I I would say for the folks entering this field in this space, I think it is a very much needed space. Yes, There are a lot of pitfalls and scary things um, and lots of challenges. But I think the reward of helping other folks just break through and embrace their sexuality, embrace their relationships. Oh my gosh, it's so, it fills my soul. It fills my heart. And I thoroughly believe that if if more of us were having meaningful relationships, meaningful intimate relationships and having great sex, then nobody would want to be starting any fucking wars out there. So <laughs> let's all get to work. Let's all get to work immediately. We can do this team. We can do it. Everyone. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Maria, thank you. And, and if, if those of you listening, watching want to hang out with Maria inside of our Lumia community, you can find her teaching intersectionality for us. So that's also one of my deepest pleasures. And all right, everyone, we'll catch you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Everything Life Coaching. If you're feeling the draw to become a coach, head to lumiacoaching.com slash everything. Explore a new career that brings fulfillment, gives you a true sense of purpose, and a bold community to do it with. Lumia is ready to equip you with the tools, training, and community you will need to reach your goals. If you're ready to build a unique coaching business on your own terms while making an impact on the world at large, Lumia is the next bold step in your coaching journey. That's lumiacoaching.com slash everything. And hey, if you're waiting for a sign, this is it.